Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It's Friday, the 6th day of August 2021, and we're going to talk about this complex pattern that has set up in the tropical Atlantic in today's update. We'll take a look ahead at the GFS and what it's showing over the next week or so, including some impacts for you folks in the Lesser Antilles from this front leading tropical wave that the National Hurricane Center has outlined, and a couple of other things for you as well as I wrap up. You saw the background behind me, like, where is he? I'm in Tucson, Arizona, wrapping up my trip out here for some research work, some observation, and uh, really the work on my documentary series, The Hurricane Highway. Why would I be in Arizona talking hurricanes? Well, you'll have to catch the episode. It'll be episode four. It'll be out in September to the public on Patreon soon, and you'll see. All right, but first up, let's talk about the tropics. National Hurricane Center gets their... Uh, seasonal outlooks from NOAA. They all work together, of course, through the Department of Commerce. And this is interesting. This is comparing last year versus this year uh, where we are. And so here is a really nice infographic that was produced by one of our back-end graphics people, Tim, Tim Melman. Thank you very much, sir, for doing this. This is great. So this is what we saw last year. We ended up with 30 named storms, 15 hurricanes, and what did we have, like seven majors or something like that? Uh, very busy season was forecast as early as last May, and then in the August update, they were forecasting 25 named storms. We ended up with 30, and we exceeded the number of hurricanes that were forecast for last year by several. So 2020 was unique. It really, really was. What about this year? Well, in the May outlook from the National, Hur the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and the Hurricane Center staff and scientists work with them, they also do from the Hurricane Research Division, part of NOAA's AOML, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, just giving credit where credit is due. But basically, uh, the ranges from April, in, or I'm sorry, May of this year, up to about 20 named storms, maybe as many as 10 hurricanes, that seems to be the ceiling, and maybe five major hurricanes, Category 3 or higher, that was in May, and the most recent outlook, uh, updated recently, that's why it's called recent, um, maybe just a little bit more than 20 named storms, still holding on to the potential of 10 hurricanes and five of them becoming major hurricanes. And this is the season as a whole, as you know, this already includes the five that we have already had, Annabelle, Claudette, Danny, and Elsa, and Elsa was a hurricane. So on Noah's forecast, we might see as many as nine more hurricanes, and we need to still have the potential of all five major hurricanes if their forecast comes to pass. Now, just a real quick thing. I know there's a lot of scoffing going on that people say they keep updating this, and eventually, of course, they're always going to be right. And I'm telling you, you're looking at it the wrong way. How many of you like sports? And before you start clicking and changing the channel and saying, I don't want to hear this, hear me out. Almost everybody at least appreciates or understands sports. You start the game, whatever it is, baseball, basketball, football, we'll use those three, or hockey, um, four, okay? Team sports, you start it off, and you have a game plan. And as the game progresses, you're winning or losing, whatever. Usually when you're losing, you adjust that game plan with different personnel on the field, different coaching strategies, different plays, and you use the data, which you see with your eyes, of what's happening in the game. And in baseball, remember, there was a famous movie called Moneyball. Uh, what was it? Jonah Hill and um, Brad Pitt, I do believe. And they used math to help figure out how to win baseball games as they evolved. And it is the same thing with meteorology, with what's going on in the pandemic. Virology, evolutionary biology, you name it. Any science is always going to be evolving, and it should, because we're never going to reach the end. And if we did, we would all be omnipotent, and it would be a very boring world. So yes, these updates are important, because we look at the data as it changes. You can try to make an update or an outlook in April or May, and then just stick with it. But I think that's doing a disservice, because things change. Mother Nature, like in baseball, throws curveballs, all right? So there's my sports analogy for you for today. And I hope it is helpful, seriously, I'm trying to get you to understand this. It's hard for me to sometimes wrap my brain around it. 
so much that I can't even say it. So this is the Colorado State University matrix of uh, forecast for this year so far. In April, a modest forecast, you know, pretty bold. It went up a little bit more in June. And then the July outlook was quite bullish, at looking at about 20 name storms. Now it's dipped down just a little bit, uh, looking at the possibility of maybe 18 total name storms, and then uh, almost 10 hurricanes and four major hurricanes. It looks like seven hurricanes and four um, major hurricanes, I believe, is what they're forecasting. You get the idea, though. A nice little slope here, slightly down in the total name storms, but the amount of hurricanes basically has stayed the same, and it is going to be a busy time to come because all of this, as I mentioned yesterday, is going to get crammed into the next 90 days. All right, so things get adjusted. We look at the data and we make the forecast for the peak part of the season, and this is where we stand. All right, so again, thanks to Tim Melman for putting these together. Pretty cool stuff. So what do we got going on out there? Well, real quick in the Eastern Pacific, a couple of systems out here that that's all the time I'm even going to mention about it. Over here closer to Mexico, a disturbance looks like it's going to develop eventually, yeah, probably, and move off in this general direction with time. So you folks here along the Mexican coastline up to the Baja, including Cabo San Lucas, shouldn't have to worry too much. If this does become a strong hurricane out in this vicinity, it could send some ocean swells up this way, but we will deal with that if and when the time comes. Now, moving over to the Atlantic, we have out here in the uh, open ocean the westward tropical wave, which will bring impacts, again, to our friends over here in the islands. We'll address that in a minute. And then we have Invest Area 92L. This has generated a lot of interest. It looked like a few days ago the models were really picking up on this. And it was going to be sent off towards the direction of all of, or most of us. Not everybody lives over there, but that watch my videos, but you get the idea. It looked like it was headed westward, and it could be the start of a very strong signal of this uptick in activity. Now, kind of pulling the reins back on the horse leaving the barn, so to speak, uh, because the model support is not quite as robust. And I'll show you why here as we move forward. First, quick satellite shot starting... Uh, basically in the west here, this is the eastern Pacific, our twin dying systems. The next system that's going to develop and again move off in this general direction with time. And then nothing through the Caribbean Gulf region or southwest Atlantic to get too bent out of shape about. So that's good news. Then over in the eastern Atlantic, a very complex situation with this monsoon trough stretched out here. And I'm going to show you what this looks like. It's pretty remarkable. You can see it on the cloud cover. And there is some broad rotation in here, but there's a lot going on. There's a lot of energy out there available in the water in the form of this stored energy from the sun comes in and gets stored in the upper ocean heat content. It's in the lower part of the atmosphere. The water vapor holds heat and energy, that latent heat getting ready to be tapped eventually. So there's a lot of energy out there. And then you have these disturbances, and they are all competing for that energy Kind of like if you brought in one pizza for a group of 15 people at a big Super Bowl party or something like that. It's a lot of competition for that one pizza, and not everybody's going to get to enjoy it, probably. And so that's kind of the thing here. There's, It's really hard for the guidance and for us as people, the numerical weather prediction and the humans, to figure out what is going to happen with all of this available energy out there. You can see it very well on a couple of other tools. The total precipitable water, all of this energy with the monsoon trough, some of it is rotating. You can see that there's a broad circulation, tremendous amounts of moisture, no question about it. The Atlantic, East Atlantic out here is moistening up. There's still some dry air that comes off of the Sahara and out of Morocco in vicinity, certainly, but it is really getting close to the point where things are primed and ready to go, but there's a lot of energy to be competed for, and there's a lot of competition uh, literally out there. All these different impulses that you can see, these areas of vorticity, are each competing for that energy, and if there was just one singular system and this big monsoon trough wasn't there, we would probably already have a named storm or two, but there's just a lot going on. Um, and keep your eyes on this right here. This is that front tropical wave that I was telling you about. 
our friends over here in the Northeast Caribbean islands are going to have to deal with that with some impacts here in the next few days. So let's slide over to the east a little bit more, and you can tell this trough, this energy, this vorticity extends thousands of miles. I mean, it really is probably a couple thousand miles there total, uh, and then on further into the Atlantic. And that's a lot of energy there trying to bundle up. You see that in the Pacific sometimes. Rare to see it this large in the Atlantic. So once we get into a more favorable uh, setup where it's just inevitable for these to form, we should get several hurricanes to develop uh, out in the eastern Atlantic and make their way west. Many will curve out to sea, but some won't. And those are the ones that we need to pay close attention to, obviously. So will anything be coming you know, from this over the next few days? Well, let's take a look at the GFS. This is the 12Z run from today. And here's that uh, monsoon trough, all that energy out there, very easily detectable in the 850 millibar geopotential height. You know, you see the cyclonic vorticity in there. Very, very easy for the numeric weather models here, the weather prediction to pick this up. There's the huge sprawling subtropical ridge sitting out there. A little bit of troughing here on the west side of it, uh, off the east coast, a little bit of a weakness. So let's just see what happens. And a couple things to watch. This piece of energy right in here, and then just this whole conglomeration right there as I put this into motion using the arrow keys on the old keyboard. So you see competing areas of vorticity, many of them down there. Nothing really trying to close off and take over. Maybe the easternmost vorticity maximum tries, but it's, it's not, that's kind of small. You know what I mean? It's not a very large area that bundles up. But watch what happens here. We're at about 78 hours out, and this tropical wave is going to begin entering the islands. And so you folks are going to have showers and thunderstorms anywhere from, you know, possibly Barbados and points north and west from there through the U.S. British Virgin Islands, St. Bart's, Anguilla, uh, you know, Guadalupe over to the U.S. British Virgin Islands, as I mentioned, and eventually maybe even Puerto Rico. I'm going to zoom in and show you this in more detail in just a moment. But... You know, nothing really comes together totally, but that doesn't matter in terms of impacts because look right here at hour 102, this tropical wave solid, solid in the model there. No question about it. It's not barely detectable, and that'll be moving into an area where we have to watch it. If it doesn't develop here, maybe it develops over here eventually. That is energy, ready to go. It just needs to find the right area. It's a seedling ready to plant its roots and take root, where does it do that? And that's what we'll have to watch and see. So that's out at about day five right there. And that's as far as we'll look, because beyond that time frame, as you know, it just gets a little too chaotic. But let's zoom in here real quick for our friends down in the islands. That leading edge of energy comes in uh, with a nice little wind surge right there. This piece of energy right here, that'll certainly have some storms with it moving through the Virgin Islands there at about day two or so. And then the rest of the tropical wave uh, comes behind, and that too will move through and bring some impacts to the region. You see it there. Uh, a lot of energy down there, a lot of heat, thunderstorms, gusty winds, some of that moving right through the Virgin Islands, you can see right there. So if you have interest down there, you're planning to go down there, and we have Brent and Matt and Tim, some of our supporters, and many other friends that I've made over the Internet because of hurricanes of the past. And so this will be passing through. Carlos in Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a live camera down there, so I have to show you that. i got to remember that. At about day five, I should pull up the cams. We have three of them. St. Thomas, St. John, and Sam Juan. Sometimes I even forget. And yes, you notice by day five, down here in the eastern Pacific, we'll need to keep an eye on that. But it looks like it'll stay safely away from Mexico. But just moving this out into time, we'll go out to a, a week just to show you. Yeah, you got to kind of watch these systems. You just never know what can happen with them when they might find a more favorable environment. All right, so don't forget, just real quick on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, that's our main social media outposts, and we are supported, as I mentioned, some of those people down on the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico through Patreon at patreon.com slash hurricane track. Wonderful group of people that help make all of this possible. I appreciate it. It allows me to travel, and I was out here in the desert southwest, again, doing some research on... The history of flooding out here, the weather impacts, and especially when tropical cyclones come up out of the Pacific and bring this area copious amounts of rain, I learned a lot. I'll be sharing it with you 
um, mainly in this episode of the Hurricane Highway that I'm working on, episode four. I'm producing it now. I've already got three of them in the can. And those are already available on Patreon, by the way. All of our patrons can enjoy this because they crowdfund it. But episode four will be a really interesting look, especially the beginning. Like, where is he? Why is he in the desert southwest? And you'll have to see and watch the episode in September unless you become a patron first. And you can watch it when it's ready here in a couple of weeks. All right, well, let me fin finish this and get it all on the uh, the web for you. And I'm going to head back up to uh, Phoenix from here in Tucson and get on the plane tonight and head back home. Thanks, as always, for watching. Have a great weekend. I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk with you some more sometime tomorrow.